In the early 19th century, pre-bound albums containing nothing more than blank pages became widely available. They were used for the newly popular leisure activity of assembling personal albums, a practice that came to be known as scrapbooking. Although a great deal has been written about the need to preserve these volumes, it is only recently that scholars have begun to view them as cultural artifacts that contain expression of the literary and rhetorical impulse to express oneself. I contend that the study of such unconventional resources will reveal important new historical insights that will broaden our understanding of the period in which they were created. Lady Carolyn Bucknell Escort received such an album as a wedding gift in 1837. She used it as a repository for words, pictures, and keepsakes for almost 40 years. The first 18 of those were spent accompanying her military husband, James Bucknell Escort, on postings throughout the British Empire. Four of these years were spent in Canada during two separate postings, 1838 to 39 during the rebellions in Upper and Lower Canada, and 1843 to 46, while her husband acted as boundary commissioner for demarcation of the border between Canada and New England. Carolyn Bucknell Escort was born into the upper echelons of Great Britain's landed gentry, at a time when patriarchal societal structures were firmly in place. As a member of one of England's privileged classes, she was one of the few women of the era with access to an education. As these watercolors and the signifiers they contain suggest, this would have included training in the arts and would have been firmly grounded in the religious and political ideologies of her era. The scene depicted here is the sitting room where Carolyn and her sisters worked and studied at Antony House, the country estate in Cornwall where she grew up and spent the first 28 years of her life. As you can see, the British Union Jack and two religious paintings are prominently displayed on the walls. The items on the desks and the activities the girls are engaged in provide clues regarding the subjects they pursued in their studies. Transcribed passages recorded in the album appear in a number of languages, including English, French, Italian, and German. They consist of a wide range of literary and religious material, providing evidence of an educated, well-read, and deeply religious woman. The National Archives of Canada acquired the album in March of 1979, but it has never before been the subject of in-depth study. More than half of its roughly 120 pages have been used to transcribe text, yet not a single sentence is expressed in Bucknell Escort's own voice. In this sense, the album serves as an example of a practice that was known as commonplacing one in which men and women transcribed selected passages from their reading as a resource for thinking, writing, and talking. Kate Chedzoy's analysis of women's commonplace writing situates this practice as a form of life writing, describing the act of writing as, quote, enabling women to voice experiences of belonging and displacement in a changing world. By recollecting their experiences and drawing on the resources of well-stocked memories, they created texts which mediate between history as it is lived and as it is written." End quote. In a similar vein, Bucknell Escort, although a talented amateur artist herself, personally created only nine of the 54 sketches and watercolors included in the album. Despite the album's lack of overtly personal content and the initial impression of randomness conveyed by the materials it contains, a detailed analysis reveals the presence of a coherent and very personal narrative. What is intriguing is that Bucknell Escort managed to accomplish this as much through her absence as through her presence. She is present in that she was the album's author and responsible for choosing what to include, where to include it, and how to group things together. Yet she also absents herself in that she uses pre-authored narrative and for the most part, visual material created by others. In seeking to understand this aspect of absence, I contend that she used a variety of coding techniques that allowed her to signify the important events of her life. Some of these allowed her to incorporate in oblique and heavily coded fashion 
those elements that pertain to her deeply private self over which she would have wanted to maintain control and share only with a select few friends and relatives, others allowed her to incorporate more public elements of her identity in a more accessible fashion that would have been more readily understood by those of her era. <clears throat> she made her husband's military career and by extension Great Britain's much larger imperial project important subjects of her album, thus allowing her to engage with the important discourses of her era. In this way, public and private facets are brought together. By understanding the how, and by that I mean the coding strategies, it has been possible to gain insight into the what, and by that I mean the broader concerns of an era and the impact they had on the life of one woman. For example, in 1838, just four months after their marriage, her husband received orders to rejoin his regiment in Canada when the British government dispatched troops to both Lower and Upper Canada in response to rebellions against British rule. This proved a pivotal juncture in her life. She wrote the following in a personal letter, quote, the day on which James received his orders, he told me he must leave me behind. There was a possibility of war, and he knew nothing of Canada or America, and thought I should be safest in England. The captain of the Hercules offered to accommodate the commissioned officer's wife in the cabins his own wife had been occupying till the vessel was ordered to sea, where our English captains are not allowed to take their wives. James could not make up his mind that he should allow his wife to go and at last referred the decision to her and his father to decide for him." End quote. This occurrence is significant on a number of levels. It was the first time in the 10 years she had known her husband that she could finally accompany him on a posting. In addition, her husband was irresolute and deferred to her wishes, albeit in consultation with his father, likely allowing her a higher degree of self-determination than she had previously known. And finally, she was herself embarking for the first time on a mission in support of the imperial interests of Great Britain. The manner in which she chose to memorialize this life-changing event in her album would only have been decipherable by those with whom she wanted to share it. It consists of an apparently unrelated extract from a poem by Samuel Rogers in which the death of Lord Byron is eulogized. British public sentiment had been sympathetic to the desire of Greece in 1821 to free itself from Turkish rule, and Britain became determined to provide assistance. Approached by British officials, Lord Byron willingly agreed to provide unofficial assistance and chartered the ship Hercules to sail to Greece where he fought and died in the Greek War of Independence in 1824. Only 14 years later, Bucknell Escort sailed on this very same ship, Hercules, to reach her first imperial posting as the wife of a British military officer. On both these voyages, the Hercules was destined for locales where military force had been ne deemed necessary to protect the interests of Imperial Great Britain. A coincidence clearly not lost on the album's creator, and one that undoubtedly telegraphed her knowledge of British history. The reason underlying such a heavily coded reference comes into focus when considered alongside the sphere in which the album would have circulated. The drawing room, a feminine space, and the room where albums were put on display and shared with visitors was one of the most public rooms in the house. Visitors extended beyond the hostess's circle of family and friends to include a wide range of casual acquaintances keen to assess her status. A visitor's ability to read and accurately interpret an album's contents would depend greatly on their knowledge of its creator. The decision to accompany her husband as an indicator of a growing sense of her own identity would most certainly have made the event worthy of memorialization in her album. However, the unusual circumstances surrounding it, specifically her husband's inability to make a decision, would likely have rendered it an event to be shared with a select few, hence the need for the heavily coded transcription. Bucknell Escort's husband died in the Crimean War in 1855, and there is but one reference to the war in the album. 
A single page bears two images relating to the war, while the page immediately following contains an extract from Manzoni's Ode to Bonaparte. My visit to Antony House last fall and a meeting with Sir Richard Carew Pohl, the sitting baronet and great-grandnephew of Bucknell Escort, provided me with much needed insight regarding these two pages. Lady Carolyn's indoctrination as an imperialist began at an early age. On a July morning in 1815, when she was just six years old, the British ship Bellerophon was seen moored in Torbay, a locale not far from her home. This ship carried Napoleon Bonaparte as prisoner and remained in Torbay for roughly three weeks prior to his conveyance to exile and imprisonment on the island of St. Helena. This circumstance brought thousands to the region to witness Bonaparte's prison ship, which was most assuredly viewed as a symbol of the tremendous imperial strength of the British crown. The pageantry and excitement surrounding this event would most certainly have had a powerful impact on the young Carolyn. It is thus fascinating to see that in her album, the one page upon which she includes imagery of the Crimea where her husband died is immediately followed by Manzoni's poem. Without explicitly saying so, Bucknell Escort has linked the death of her husband during a British imperial war to the imperial and martial glory of both Napoleon himself and the empire that defeated him, thus dramatizing both the significance of her husband's career and the profundity of the loss she has experienced. She could not have chosen a grander figure or a more grandiose imperial history with which to link her husband and commemorate his own imperial stature and career. It would appear that a dominant optic through which she framed her life was one of imperialism. Nowhere is this more visible than in her account of their first military posting as a married couple to Canada. After the American War of Independence, Lower Canada became Great Britain's largest and most important colony in North America. It is not surprising that the British government dispatched an unprecedented number of troops to the Canadas in 1837 in response to rebels seeking greater independence from British rule. The speed with which the uprisings were brought under control became a tremendous reaffirmation of British imperial strength. A sequence in the album pertaining to this period includes two poetic excerpts. The first, Horseshoe Fall, Niagara, is a passage describing the falls. And the second, The Indian Girl, is a poem that writes of an Indian girl who lost her life when her canoe went over the falls. These passages are followed by a watercolor, the Crescent Fall at Niagara from near the Clifton, painted by a senior military officer, Sir William John Codrington. While Niagara Falls represents a sublime aspect of Canada's landscape, it is here depicted in a style that is simultaneously both sublime and picturesque. Marilyn McKay has identified this to be a common trait found in Canadian landscape painting done by British military artists during this period, and suggests that it expresses, quote, a sense of place and displacement or tension, end quote. In this scene, two individuals, possibly an adult accompanied by a child, are dressed in Western attire. Their presence attests to the ease of accessibility to the site and by extension, perhaps also the ease with which British colonizers had access to North America. Equally, the smallness of the foreground figures in relation to the vastness of the natural world that surrounds them creates a certain dissonance, possibly referencing the uncertainty surrounding England's control over their resource-rich Canadian colony. Including this image in the album would have allowed family and friends to visualize a notable feature of an important British imperial colony, depicted in a style recognizable as their own. At the same time, the recognition of the beauty of the Canadian scenery reinforced the value of Britain's territorial acquisitions. However, when viewed in conjunction with the narrative of the poems, it would also have allowed her to suggest that the colonizing British knew how to deal with the threatening landscape safely, unlike the indigenous peoples who were, quote, in need of protection, end quote. As Colin Coates has written, the use of the picturesque style to portray imperial landscapes not only allows colonists and metropolitans to maintain their identity, but also to preserve their personal dignity by viewing themselves as a civilized and civilizing people. The question as to why Bucknell Escort chose to include an image of Niagara Falls painted by a British military artist in her album rather than one she herself had painted 
needs to be addressed, particularly given the existence of watercolors of the same sub subject attributed to her and included in her husband's album. Perhaps the very gendered implications of the narrative of empire that she was constructing in her album, as distinct from the nature of her contributions to her husband's album, can best explain it. In that, by absenting herself from the telling, Bucknell Escort allowed her public imperialist identity to be very present without expressly inserting herself into a narrative of colonial conquest that was publicly constructed largely as a masculine endeavor. As signifiers in her husband's album, Lady Carolyn's watercolors could unproblematically stand as indicators of his wife's talents and affection, while the large colonial tale could remain his to tell. In her own album, however, the conflicting elements of femininity and colonialism were differently navigated, more specifically through an erasure of her personal involvement. As an upper-class British military wife, Bucknell Escort's concern for the imperial interest of Great Britain would have marched hand-in-hand hand with her commitment to the advancement of her husband's military career. Given her elevated social status, the men and women who frequented her drawing room would likely often have been capable of exerting considerable influence. Victorian albums were certainly a source of entertainment and literary discussion, but were also important vehicles through which their creators could express opinions and direct discussions. Nowhere is this conjunction of public and private interests more apparent than in her decision to include the 3,500-word first-person account by one private Townsend of an overland trek undertaken by the 43rd Light Infantry from New Brunswick to Quebec during the dead of winter in December of 1837. The fact that this trek actually predated the couple's arrival in Canada and bore no direct relation to the military career of her husband helps to demonstrate that Bucknell Escort had an absolute commitment to the cause of British imperialism. The quickness with which the British military successfully responded to the uprisings in Canada, despite the extreme winter condi conditions, stood as an impressive evidence of British imperial strength. As a military wife, traveling on her first overseas posting with her husband, she may have simply been keen to document that which was most assuredly viewed as a heroic achievement of her husband's regiment. The Winter March of the 43rd is, however, the only military action depicted in the album during their first Canadian posting, and it is one in which her husband did not personally participate. Was she trying in some way to associate her husband with the march? Such an association would certainly have cast him in a positive light to those who would view her album and would definitely have made his first Canadian posting far more impressive from a military careerist point of view. It is noteworthy that just three years after returning to England, James was offered the important position of boundary commissioner, charged with working with the Americans to survey and permanently mark the Canada-US border between Canada and New England. Records indicate that he was likely offered this position via family connections. In conclusion, I hope that I have been able to demonstrate the richness of the narrative that can be found between the pages of Victorian albums. While it is true that Bucknell Escort fashioned her album in a manner that respected the feminine conventions of her era, I would argue that this did not limit the bounds of the narrative that she constructed. By identifying and decoding the creative strategies she employed, I have revealed a woman with strong colonial and imperial convictions, a woman who was willing to sacrifice a great deal in their pursuit. As Leah Ina Hunt wrote in her 2006 PhD dissertation, quote, scrapbooks are valuable artifacts of literary and rhetorical acts with much to contribute to our profession and to our understanding of individual participation in our culture and our history, end quote. The time to study such cultural artifacts is now. Their ongoing deterioration and the lack of appreciation of their importance as valuable research tools highlights the need for action. Thank you.